welcome to the Business Fighter with Henry Penix. Henry has been the CEO, founder, and consultant to hundreds of companies worldwide. He retired a multimillionaire, financially independent at the age of 35. Henry grew up a preacher's son and was thrown in jail three times for various altercations. He knows what it means to come from nothing and have to fight his way to the top. Henry is the business fighter who will teach you strategic skills for winning in business and in life. Don't just spectate, participate. It's time to get in the ring. Hi, this is Henry Penix, the business fighter. I'm here with an amazing gentleman that you guys are going to uh, really have a great time with learning about what he's done, particularly in the automotive industry and with customer experience. This guy has had uh, dealings with Google, with uh, some of the largest companies in the world. He's been um, interviewed by CNN Money, Fox Business, Bloomberg Technology, CBS News. He runs one of the number one, I guess the number one certified Honda and Acura dealership in the world out of the Queens, New York. They do over a thousand cars a month. He not only does that, he's very benevolent. He uh, is active in his community. He supports uh, different women in automotive actions, teams for kids, New York Roadrunners, the American Cancer Society, Foundation Fighting Blindness, the Starlight Foundation, and the list goes on and on and on. And he's also completed, this is very cool, 23 marathons, including Boston, Chicago, Miami, London, wow. and New York. My God, Brian, what don't you do? <laughs> wow, that's great. Very kind of you, Henry. Very, very good to be on your show, too. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. I, I love to talk to business people. When I bring someone on, Brian, my audience is expecting to hear from people who can give them certain nuggets. Uh, I call them golden nuggets that they they may not read from a textbook. They might may not even learn in their life. But before we get into that, I want to I want to learn a little bit about you, if you don't mind. I'm a very much a people person, and I would love to know how you got started in cars. Like like what turned you on about that, and and to be so customer focused and oriented, and to do so well. What 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 gave you that fire? You know, I I, I I took a job selling cars in 1982. Uh, it, was, it was a summer job, and I started May 10th. And I, I, I took that job until something better came along. And I realized when I had the job that there were some people there that weren't all that sharp, yet they were adults. I was, you know, I was 22 years old, but they were adults, and they were supporting a family and children. And I said, gee, if they can do that, and if I could earn that kind of money, this could be something that's that's interesting. Right. And I, you know, and so I got around a, a couple of really good salespeople initially in my career, and they were they were very professional. They dressed right. They they had the right. Uh, they spoke properly to customers. I thought they set a very very good example for me early on. And I'd say after about a year, a year and a half of doing it, I really made a commitment to the business. And um, it's thirty six years later, thirty seven years later. And nothing better has come along. I think the business is a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal business. And um, I think I've, I've always tended to look at things from a perspective. How can we do it a little bit better? And, and I guess when I was younger, it was how can we do things a little bit easier? Uh, and, but today it's better and more efficient. And, and, and it can't be from our perspective, but it's got to be from the customer's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, you, if we're not pleasing the customer, we're not winning. So you went from basically getting a job just to kind of try it out. And what I heard you say was you found some good mentors, some people who I assume that you saw that were doing very well at what they did. And you learned a little from them uh, initially. Is that true? Well, it is. You know, I read a, a book uh, in the 80s uh, called uh, Seeds of Greatness by Dennis Waitley. And he said the three most influential things would be imitation, observation and repetition. So, you know, I found the people that were successful. And, you know, I, take it from a, a guy in 1982, there was a salesperson that was making nearly $100,000. I thought this person was God. Yeah. So I sat and, and, and I watched, I observed, and then I imitated what he said. And then I just keep kept repeating it. And I remember one particular day he was sitting in front of me and I'm talking to a customer and I'm like a parrot word for word saying what he had been saying just uh, one customer before. And he turned around and looked at me like, you son of a gun. And sure, <laughs> enough, sure enough, those words that worked with his customer also worked with mine. And it was really a, a, a lifelong learning lesson. You know, find people that are doing it uh, and then imitate what they're doing. And then the last step now, I guess, is to then improve upon whatever they're doing. And, and um, that, that process has not stopped some 37 years later. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll, I'll put a, an exclamation mark on that. I, when I started with the Pitney Bowes Corporation, they do the postage meters with a little indicia. And I was with them as a 22 year old. I was just looking for a better job. And I, it's so funny you just said that because I did the same thing. I saw some of those guys in there making 100, 150,000 a year. And I thought the same thing. I thought, man, I'm going to buy a Porsche. I can do this. I can do that. And I did the, I did the same thing. I started listening to them and I started emulating them. And within a year, I was the regional sales manager there talking to guys who were 50 about their right. environment that I didn't know anything about. But just because I was good in sales, I, I got put in that position. So you got that ROL, right? The return on learning. And you took their experience in the ROE, the return on their experience. And you were able to learn what took may have taken them 20 years in a shorter period of time. Now, there's nothing that beats experience, but you were able to get a lot of that experience packed into a short period of time. And then you had this incredible advantage of youth. Right. You, you, so you, you learn to do it. <laughs> yeah. You had the energy to do it. And, and sure enough, you're running around and some of the uh, older uh, guys there are like, look at this guy go. And, <laughs> and, and I think there's a, I've had a couple of things that I've been blessed with. I, I think I have a youthful energy and a youthful spirit, even at the ripe old age of 58 years of age, I'm, I'm oh learning God, every day. 58. I am 58, huh? but, but take a look at like a Tesla, right? They're selling cars now online. It's impossible for them to do that without somebody else being able to emulate that. Now we want to be fair. We don't want to knock it off, but certainly success leaves clues. And if you have an online platform that's delivering something, what well, will well, the others out there can learn for it, from it? So it's important that we, strive constantly to create a strategic competitive advantage that, that, that will stay with us. And, and that's very difficult in today's marketplace. I think Warren Buffett said it, you can get a, a competitive advantage if you're at a baseball game simply by standing up. And that gives you a competitive advantage over the person in front of you. But then the person behind you stands up, the person in front of you stands up, and you don't have that competitive advantage. So you, what we need to look for is a sustainable competitive advantage. And that's going to be by inventing and reinventing and reinventing ourselves over and over again. Guys, I hope you're getting this. This is the, He's already dropping these golden nuggets, and, and I'm only going to repeat them because I love them. He talked about your ROL, your, your return on learning and your ROE, your return on experience, how yeah, those can yeah. look for you. Success leads clues. Are you guys listening to this? I've read a lot of Warren Buffett stuff and I've never heard that, Brian, myself, yeah. but it, it, yeah. it's so true. You, you've taken that stuff and you're doing something with it so now. You're, you're jumping into the game. You're improving, I would assume, every month of your life. You, you want to be better than the last month. You, you're not sure. really even competitive with other people, but with yourself to better yourself because you're number one. I mean, you're number one in the industry. Who do you compete with? Like you're competing well, with yourself. Yeah, the, the goal is for first outwork uh, and outperform uh, and outplan everybody else in the marketplace and, and, and really to out strategize. And I think hard work, I mean, it's something that uh, people don't necessarily want to hear today. Uh, it seems old fashioned, but old, uh, hard work really works and uh, nothing works until you do. And I think if anything, we are really extremely competitive. It's one of the reasons that I run. I think it's very analogous to running a business, especially uh, marathon running. It really makes you find out who you are and prepares you for what's coming. So we're, we're, we're gonna continue to uh, invent and reinvent, or as uh, Toffler said it, learn, unlearn, and relearn. Alvin Toffler, wrote a book in the seventies called future shock. And it, that was one of the founding principles, right? Is learn, unlearn and relearn. And this is in the seventies. It's never been more true than it is today. That's it, They're saying information is doubling every 24 hours. And with the build out of the internet, that's going to increase to every 12 hours. How the heck can we keep up with information doubling every 24 hours? And the simple answer is you can't. Uh, the better answer is you've got to be really uh, become an expert at your craft or your field. And, uh, you know, I think that's what we're striving to do. Let laser focused. I, I want to get into a little bit of, of what you're doing to now and some of the, the experiences that you've had with Google. And before I get off, please don't let me forget this. I want to go through your day with you because you 
you, you run, you're in great shape. You look, you don't want to, you don't want to go through my day. My day starts. <laughs> yes, I really do. Early. Yeah. Have to hear this. They have to know the price that you pay to get where you are. So I want to do that later, but before we jump into that, let's talk about you, you playing with Google, you, you looking at these different huge companies that you're actually doing business with and the idea of a frictionless future. That's huge. Explain what that means. And then let's talk about you playing with Google a little bit. Oh, okay. So, you know, the uh, customers are going to do what's in their intelligent self-interest at all times. And people are always going to look, be looking for what's best for them. And we, we found that many of the sales processes that we have are built to serve us, not the customer. Take a look at your shopping cart. If you were to go to a supermarket, uh, you, you go and you have a, you know, this long story short, we had a, um, a professor who asked us to redesign the shopping cart at, at NYU. And, um, and, we, we broke into a team of five and we had some people that were draftsmen that were drawing. And I said, can I please do this? I'm not an artist, but can I please do it? And they said, sure. And I drew two boxes and I drew an arrow from one box to the other and then from the other one back. And I, I submitted that to the professor and the professor said, what is this? And I said, it's the redesign of the shopping cart. I said, well, I don't understand. Well, I said, this is your house. That's the store. You buy it online. The food gets shipped to your house. And he said, well, that wasn't the uh, question. And I said, but, but it is the answer. And, oh uh, and, and, and uh, this, you can't make this stuff up. The next day, Amazon bought Whole Foods for $28 billion. Yes. And I, I certainly sent an email to the professor said, what do you think of it now? <laughs> and, 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 but but this, you know, this idea was not new to me uh, then. It wasn't new when Amazon bought it. Peapod has been doing this for some time. But when you look at the process of using a shopping cart, you go into the supermarket and what do you do? You have to go uh, up each and every one of the aisles. Right. And what do you do? You load the shopping cart and they put the vegetables up front because you want to get healthy and they want you to get the healthy stuff out of the way. Cause they know once you've done that, you're satisfied that, okay, I bought the healthy stuff. You will load it up with junk the rest of the way. Absolutely. At the end of the last aisle, they've got the milk and the perishables, the eggs. And then, and then you check out, what do you do? You unload the shopping cart onto the conveyor belt. Then what do you do? You pay for the food. Then what do you do? You reload the shopping cart. Then what do you do? You go out to your car. Then what do you do? You unload the shopping cart. Then what do you do? You go home. Then what do you do? You um, unload the car. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so my, my uh, statement that the best redesign of the shopping cart is perhaps it's elimination um, is led me to believe or, or to think what in our own business are we doing that where we can't see that we've put these impediments in the way of the consumer. And, and by the way, if the customer is buying online from you uh, and they have a good experience, they will buy online from you food consistently. You know, let's face it, your diet doesn't change as much as you'd like to think. It's pretty static. You may be having some people over and buy something extra, you know, seasonally you may buy different things and, and perhaps you want to stop in the store and buy produce or fresh. I got it. But 90% of what you're doing can be done where it's brought right to your front door. You just bring it into the house and put it on the shelves and you, you just saved the customer a ton of time. And, and so we, we thought, how does that relate to our sales process? And perhaps the best redesign of the sales process is its elimination. And we started and this going is at on your that car dealership. This is at your yeah, car dealership. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we've all got, you know, many car dealerships have this, what we call the road to the sale in the sales process. Okay. And for us, it's opening investigation, selection, demonstration, verification, appraisal, close, uh, TO. And that's our, I guess, eight step process to the sale. But this is, built to make it easier for us to get what we want from the consumer. What if we did it the opposite way? And, and this started this on a journey where I was at a meeting with Google and I sort of uh, asked Google, uh, Hey Google, uh, the people that were there, what's the number one search engine? They all responded. Google. Right, right. And I said, what's the number two search engine? And they all responded, YouTube. And I said, okay, let me change the question slightly. What's the number one search engine for retail? And there was silence. And I said, well, it's Amazon. And it's two to one over Google. And why is that? And wow. when we asked why, why is that, you know, Google brings a customer to the product using search, right? You, you, you search and uh, you're searching for something, water skis, jet skis, and, uh, and then they tell you the places you can buy it. Uh, conversely, uh, Amazon uh, will bring that product to you. 
And when you look at the fact that 1,100 stores, 11,000 stores, excuse me, have gone out of business in the last two years in the United States of America during one of the best economies we've had ever. You know, if you listen to the president, he says it's the best ever. I, you know, I'm not going to argue uh, whether it's best or second best. It's a good economy, right? And, right. and you There's got no 11, to lose in this economy. Right. You got 11,000. Uh, store closings in this good economy. Why? Uh, and consumers are not consuming less. They're just consuming differently. And, and we, if you don't shift to that difference, you, you can find yourself on the outside looking in instead of on the inside looking out. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we got together with the folks at Google and we said, can you help us um, to fix that, solve for that problem in automotive. And, and together we developed a, a process and a system where uh, we can have customers use the Google assistant and voice to make a command to have the, the dealership pick up their car for service, service the car and return it back to the customer. Uh, and in, in, in the case of many of our customers that live in New York city, we're picking up their car after work, bringing it to the dealership, servicing it and putting it back in the garage before they need it in the morning. Uh, oh my gosh. Completely frictionless transaction. Wow. And the, the response from the marketplace has been nothing short of breathtaking uh, where the business is up 300% in one year. The profit per transaction is up 200%, 220%. And we're not charging the customers for the service, the pickup and delivery. So, oh, so we, 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 we and, and we like to believe that once you've had that service, you'll never want to go to the dealership. Um, my brothers and sisters that own automobile dealerships, they really have done a good job trying to improve the customer experience, right? I, I know a dealership in Florida, they have a putting green uh, inside the service department. I know another one that's got a bowling alley. Several have beauty parlors. Uh, it the, the, the does not address the underlying fact customers do not want to go to your dealership for service. Right. Period. They don't, I, I don't want to go to a dealership to putt. I don't want to go to a dealership to get a haircut. I don't want to go to a dealership at all. And so why not own that fact and build it based on the facts, not what we'd like to believe, you know, and Brian, let me ask you this. Do you think it's a lot of guys who have invested in these magnificent, beautiful dealerships that it's, that it's a lot of their own ego. And they're saying, dude, you are going to come in. You are going to look at my dealership because I made it. I, I, I did this and I want to show it off to you, but they're not even thinking what the customer really wants. Do, do you think Henry, part of it? you just, you just, you just nailed it. I mean, that's, that's a half of the equation, but that's a big half. I, you know, if a dealer just spent $20 million on a service facility and right. here's this guy saying, I don't want customers to go to the service department. Right. It's counterintuitive. <laughs> Uh, right. The other uh, uh, challenge is the service advisors who generate repair orders and, and serve the customers get paid based on the amount of selling they do. So, uh, you know, in many cases, those service advisors feel that they can't generate as much profit if the customer is not sitting in front of them. We found just the opposite is true. If the customers are uh, not inconvenience, they're much more willing to spend money. And, and think of it, uh, we're doing it all on, on the cell phone for the customer. We can give them an Amazon type experience where we can say, you, you, here are your old brakes, here are new brakes. Would you like to buy them? Customer sees the evidence and sees the price and says, yes. And they click that they'd like to purchase the brakes. Um, once they've done that, the next uh, prompt that they get is customers who bought this also usually buy that. Well, very Amazon-esque, right? And, and we're not selling them things that they don't need. But when, when you do have one service, there are historically other things that you need to have at that time. Sure. So, sure. you know, it's just providing customer value. And again, it solves for the customer not having to come back to the dealership to address those issues down the road. So the customers would rather spend a little bit more and get it all done at one time. And we think that's uh, uh, that's been a really great ROL for us, a return on learning. We did not know that. We were counting on the, the customers um, giving us loyalty because of the good service. We never thought that they'd be paying or, or that we, they'd be purchasing much more uh, service items from us as a result of that, which is cool. Right. You, you just did it to make it frictionless and easier for the customer. Yeah. Everything yeah. that you learned today to implement it, but you got more, you got more of a return on your investment in that, I would assume. Yeah. 
in the five boroughs of the encompass New York City, there are over 10,000 independent service facilities. That means non-dealer service facilities. So the competitor is not the Honda dealer that's seven miles away. The competitor is the 10,000 other people oh offering gosh. service on every block. And with this, we can beat them at their own game because most of the people are going to independence because of proximity and, and, and price. We can beat them on both proximity and price, especially if we're picking it up. I know one thing uh, right now, you're not in your car and I'm not in my car. Uh, and most customers use their car 6% of the time. So why not make better use of the other 94% of the time and service the customer's car when they don't need it instead of uh, making them babysit their car while your de service department services the car. Wow, and that, and that, that's this, brilliant. This, this, is, this has been pretty, pretty outrageous for us. It's been great for Google because we've been using a lot of their marketing platforms to attract the customers to this, to monitor the customer experience uh, and to do it in a cost-effective manner. So it's really been a very good, um, I'll call it a partnership. Uh, it's not truly a partnership, but working on their platform. And I think that's one of the ways that regular retailers, large and small, can compete with the big four, the, you know, the Amazons, the Apples, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, is by using their platforms. The, you know, the internet is available to all of us. And so we, we're making very good use of a Google platform to drive customer intention uh, using YouTube and video to drive store visits using some of the other Google products and then uh, using their voice technology to bring our customers into the 21st century. Yeah, but Brian, if you weren't laser focused on that and if you weren't trying to make yourself better every day, you never would have even come across this. I mean, you would have been one of the other 10,000 service things out there that that are, are struggling with the guy next door, but you found a way, you, you understood that you can't scale, especially in New York with real estate. So you scaled digitally, digitally by bringing that experience to yes. everybody. And then you went out and did it. Like you made it work. You showed up, you showed off and you showed up how to, how to do it. And you, you're winning, like you're winning really big. I guys, again, I hope this is Henry, the business fighter. I hope you guys are getting all this. I hope you replay this so many times because this guy is an out of the box thinker. He he's, he's dropping nuggets. I'm going to go back and listen to this myself because of the nuggets that he's dropping that has even caused me to think about the businesses that I'm involved right now. This is, this has been amazing. Brian, I'd like to do this one last thing if I could I want to go through and you don't have to be as detailed, you know, be as detailed as you want to be, but, but I want to go through your day. Like, 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 do you sleep in till 10? Do you get a massage? Then do you, you know, maybe get to work by two or three? <laughs> uh, uh, if I were asleep at 10 in the morning, my, my wife would call uh, uh, an ambulance or, <laughs> or, 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 or a coroner. Um, he starts, uh, I'm out of bed. at uh, four o'clock in the morning. I'm reading um, usually the first uh hour of the day I'm reading, then um, I'm catching up on uh, what's going on in the world, uh, usually via uh, a Google assistant. As crazy as it is, uh, I'll ask it for my daily briefing and it'll play uh, NPR, Fox, BBC, and then tech news. So that's the, the next hour. Then uh, I hit the gym. Uh, I have a gym close by my house. It's usually 45 minutes to an hour of strength training, followed by 45 minutes to an hour of running. And then uh, wow. uh, uh, shower, shave, and uh, get myself to to work. Day usually is about uh, ten to ten to twelve hours uh, a day, and that's uh, 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 pretty much the schedule. It's it just you know, uh, lather, rinse, repeat. That's the schedule. That's the schedule. You know, <laughs> do, do you watch uh, your Do you watch your diet? Do you try to eat certain? Yeah, food? yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, of course. I've got a nutritionist, and we're, we're watching everything that I'm eating. Uh, making sure that that, I mean, and it's, it's not egocentric. It's really, I want to be around. I want to see this world unfold. I want to live as long as I can live. I think it's, we're in exciting times and it's a great time to be an entrepreneur right now. It's never been uh, more affordable for us to reach customers and to make noise and get attention than we can with a, a cell phone and, and your good ideas behind it. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll tell you what, I, I may be reaching out to you again for another interview because I've got a thousand more questions and I've got like three minutes left. <laughs> so so I, I think what you've already delivered, Brian, has been 
amazing. I don't say that about everyone, but the intelligence, I can almost feel you thinking when you're answering these questions. It's like you're asking me about my children. I mean, we, we live this. Think of a Kobe Bryant, right? Kobe's up at three o'clock in the morning and starts his practice at four o'clock, four to six. Uh, at six o'clock, he has a breakfast, rests for about a half an hour, then goes back and, and, and practices from 7.30 to, to 10 uh, and then uh, has a mid-morning lunch and then would go back and practice with the team uh, from 11 to 1. You know, and, and when most of the other guys were working out two hours a day, he's working out six to eight hours a day. And, you know, as he says, you know, it, it gives you a double the advantage and you start to pile those up over the weeks, over the months, over the years, and the others can't compete. Think of Kobe's last game. I mean, watch that on YouTube. YouTube, Kobe Bryant's last three minutes as a Laker. And he scored, he scored 60 points on the way out the door. 99.9% .9 of the people that play in the NBA will never score 60 points. He's retiring from the sport and nobody was cutting him any slack. He's there hitting shots and you see the celebrities on the sideline go, Oh my God, they can't believe it. You know, the, the guy is just unbelievable, but it was, it wasn't just talent. It was practice. It was outworking everybody else. And, you know, so I, I, I think, you know, and, and we had our, our sales meeting this morning. I said to my, my managers, why would he be more interested in his business than you or I would be in our business. It's our life. This is our livelihood. This is our craft. And why would somebody playing basketball give more of themselves than what we do? Frankly, you can't say the money because the top people in my industry earn more than the top people in the NBA. There's nobody in the NBA earning a billion dollars playing basketball. Whereas right. I know several billionaire automobile dealers. So right. you know, it's, it's really uh, it's just what, you, what are you going to apply uh, and what, how much effort are you going to apply? And uh, I'm still working on that myself. How do we take that game up always to that next level? Yeah, no, I, I hear you. If, if somebody wants to come see you in New York City, if they want to buy a car from you, uh, can you share where your dealership is and your hours of operation and all that? I at least want to get that in. We are a Paragon Honda, Paragon Acura. We're two miles over the 59th Street Bridge in sunny Queens, New York. Uh, but the easiest place to visit us is at Paragon Honda.com or Paragon Acura.com because we can do all of the transaction online. You can come to the dealership or you can do it online. We can send it to you. You can send you a test drive uh, as far away as Chicago uh, or, or Texas. Uh, if you're interested in a car, we'll send it to you. Oh, my gosh. that, that That's amazing. This has truly been a gift. Uh, guys, Henry, the business fighter, I hope you've listened to every word he has said. Do me a huge favor. Go out and review this podcast. Go out and rate it. Uh, I already know the rating you're going to give it. And, and do something special. Send this to 10 of your friends that you might think would learn something from this and enjoy it and, and give them some ideas about maybe growing their own business. Send it to, and also send it to 10 of your lazy friends, send it to those people. But by the time they wake up, this guy's already worked out, been updated on world news and is hitting a sales meeting. I mean, this is real stuff. And, and I, Brian, you'll never know how much I've personally enjoyed this. Uh, thank you very much. You've been a, uh, an amazing inspiration to so many people. And I, I'm in New York every once in a while. I hope to come visit you sometime personally. Uh, you're, you're an amazing uh, I, 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 I'd like that. I'd like that very much, Jeremy. Th thank you. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon.